Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are on the surface of this planet. Welcome to episode 12 of Clash of the Titans, the debate that the Education Committee of the ISPM hosts on the first and third Friday of every month. As we get to Christmas, this is not much time for a debate because everybody's friendly. And so we have two friendly debaters uh, talking today, both from the United States. And debating is, of course, something that um, we've seen in uh, various forms in the United States recently. So I'm sure this will be a debate with a lot of merry cheer and festive spirit. And what we're going to talk about today is about children with scoliosis. Children with scoliosis who have asymptomatic tethering, is it that deformity correction can only be done after untethering as a primary procedure or not? And we have two of the most famous pediatric spine surgeons uh, to contest that motion. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome to this debate, Douglas Brockmeyer. He's the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at the Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah. And Doug, of course, has a huge number of publications on craniovertebral anomalies and uh, deformities of the pediatric spine. And um, amongst other things, um, I am a member of his spine fan club. <laughs> the speaking against Doug, or daring to speak against Doug, and that makes him famous straight away, is uh, Richard Anderson. Richard, of course, is another uh, extremely talented spine surgeon who's, um, whose spine surgeries we've witnessed at every presentation in the ISPM. He's attached to the Columbia University Medical Center and the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital in New York. And of course, Richard is uh, also very much interested in pediatric deformities. So without uh, much ado, I'm gonna start this off. Doug is gonna speak to us in favor of the motion, in favor of the motion that children with scoliosis and asymptomatic tethering can have their deformity corrected without a primary untethering procedure. All yours, Doug. Great, thanks, Sandeep. I'm gonna share my screen here. Everybody see this okay? I hope so. Great, so thanks, Sandeep, for that very nice introduction. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be here in episode 12 of the ISPN Clash of the Titans. Uh, and I uh, uh, wanted to extend my greetings also to Rich Anderson and everybody in the audience. Uh, as uh, Sandeep said, my topic today or our topic today is to discuss if children with scoliosis and asymptomatic tethering deformity correction may be done without untethering as a primary procedure. And I am speaking in favor of that proposal. So, Let's see, we gotta get this to advance. There we go. I have no financial disclosures. However, I do need to uh, disclose that I helped train Dr. Anderson. And in fact, you could say that I taught him everything that he knows. Uh, here he is as a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed uh, pediatric neurosurgery fellow 16 years ago, way back in 2004 with a full head of hair, but luckily he's matured into a very uh, uh, thoughtful, kind, uh, wonderful spine surgeon. Not a lot of hair these days, uh, but uh, a wonderful nonetheless, and I'm looking forward to his comments. So before I begin, I wanted to extend uh, my personal greetings from, from Utah, uh, Salt Lake. That's where I am. It's about six in the morning. Many of you have traveled here. Uh, this is Bryce uh, National Park. Maybe some of you have done some sightseeing here, done some skiing or perhaps some other outdoors activity like fishing. And um, 
This is our hospital, Primary Children's Hospital. It's a level one pediatric trauma center. Uh, encompasses services such as pediatric epilepsy, comprehensive spine disorders, neuromuscular disorders, oncology, and craniosynostosis, among other things. So uh, we extend our invitation for you to come visit us. We also, uh, I want to take this opportunity to also extend the invitation to come and visit uh, us for the 50th annual meeting, the silver meeting of the AANS um, CNS Joint Section on Pediatric Neurological Surgery that's going to be held uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah, held over from last year, from 2020. This year is going to be December 7th through 10th, 2021. So book your flights. On behalf of my partners, John Kessel, Rob Bolo, and Sam Cheshire, I wanted to extend our personal invitation. The, uh, the meeting will be held at the Grand America Hotel, a five-star luxury hotel in the middle of Salt Lake City. And uh, we really hope that uh, many of you can be with us. So uh, 2020, so what is there to say? Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, fear of the coronavirus is on the decline. Well, release the murder hornets. And it seems like in the United States, we, sure, we certainly got our share of the murder hornets this year. And hopefully that 2021 will be a little bit better. And then there's online learning. And uh, maybe some of us have turned into zombies. This is me uh, back in probably January, February, 2020. And then me just a few days ago after several thousand hours in front of the computer uh, uh, doing my Zoom calls and online learning. So hopefully I'll try to make this uh, discussion as uh, entertaining and as informative as possible. So uh, I want to share with you how the invitation came to me um, uh, to do this talk. And as many of you in the audience know, it's very difficult to say no to Sandeep Chatterjee. And I, so here's a picture of him and I just taken a little while ago, Dr. Chatterjee on the right, me on the left. Uh, and he sends me an email and he says, Doug, I need you to do an impossible task. <laughs> yes, Dr. Chatterjee. Doug, I want you to debate against Dr. Anderson and the entire medical literature. <laughs> yes, Dr. Chatterjee. And when I started looking at the topic, uh, I really started feeling like Perseus on his winged horse uh, 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 clashing against the Titans in the 2010 remake of the film. And there's me flying into the maw of the, of the Kraken and then Dr. Anderson, the entire medical literature. So I really have my work cut out for me and hopefully we can, we can make this happen. So hopefully at the end of the debate, we're a little closer to the truth and we can uh, uh, help uh, children and families along the way. So I wanna start with a case, uh, as an actual case that we saw not too long ago, the eight-year-old boy with a trisomy eight mosaic. And uh, hopefully my little arrow will, will move and you can see this. Uh, as part of the uh, presentation. So you can see he's got a, a, a thoracolumbar scoliosis and an L3 hemivertebrae here. On the left-hand side, this is a coronal MRI image. The sagittal MRI shows that his conus ends slightly lower than normal, probably mid L2. And lower down on the sagittal MRI, you can see uh, a, a fatty thickened phylum on the sagittal image. And on the axial image, excuse me, on the axial image, he's got uh, the, the, the fatty phylum. So he's a kid we've been following for a while. He's no, we know he has progressive scoliosis. His current Cobb angle is 61 degrees. His, he's got an immature spine. He's only eight years of age, but he's progressing pretty quickly. He's got a low-lying conus and a fatty phylum. When you start talking to the mom, he's, uh, he's still not toilet trained despite his age, and he still has a lot of accidents. So I do a complex spine clinic with our orthopedic colleagues uh, just about once a week. And we debated about what to do with him, whether we should untether him beforehand or not. And we're gonna, we're gonna come back to this case at, at the end of the talk, but I want you to think about this case while we're going through the, uh, the information. So no one wants to do unnecessary spinal cord untethering procedures. Uh, but thankfully, given very recent encouraging medical evidence, the issue, the issue is actually pretty straightforward. If, you have, if you're a, a child with scoliosis and you have an asymptomatic tethered cord, uh, 
uh, you should be able to undergo spinal deformity correction without untethering. And, um, uh, and, that, and that's pretty clear. However, on closer inspection, when you really dig into this topic, the issue is really not that simple. And that's because the term tethered spinal cord is actually very imprecise. Uh, there's different types of tethered cords. There's split cords and fat phylums and lipomas and myelomeningocele placodes. And the term means different things to different people. So uh, there's, there, there's not uniform uh, agreement about what the term actually means. And there's also many different types of scoliosis. Uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis or AIS, neuromuscular scoliosis, early onset scoliosis and congenital scoliosis. And they all mean different things uh, with different presentations with different patient populations. So again, that, that makes this topic even more complex. And then it, it turns out that a lot of the medical evidence that's, that's being accumulated here is being uh, uh, acquired by uh, non-neurosurgeons or non-tethered uh, spinal cord experts, not people that, that live and breathe this type of, of, of topic every single day. Some of them are orthopedic surgeons that may or may not have really good insight into this disease process. So these are some of the issues that make this um, uh, issue a little bit more complex. So when I trained uh, in pediatric neurosurgery, we did my fellowship, every single uh, child with, uh, say, spina bifida uh, and, and scoliosis underwent a preoperative prophylactic untethering procedure. And typically, these were done in two stages. First stage, uh, and, and the untethering procedure with us, and then the spinal deformity correction days or weeks later by the orthopedic surgeons. And then we started doing it uh, at, at the same time, at the same sitting. Sometimes they turn into very long cases, but we could do them at the same time. There were, there were selected cases where we would do chordectomies for gibbous deformities, and that was pretty straightforward. And there was this era where we were doing a lot of cord untetherings for these kids. But it's, it's clear that uh, over time, the concept has evolved into um, uh, thinking about doing no untethering. And many in the audience are probably listening to me and thinking that I'm completely crazy because they would never untether a, a patient like this prophylactically anyways. But I'll tell you that for at least uh, where, where I trained in, in many portions of North America, this was very, very commonplace and standard of care for this type of uh, disease process. So the, the, the literature is actually relatively new and uh, begins around 2010, 2011. Here's a paper from um, uh, 2011 from Johns Hopkins. And it sort of uh, uh, reflects the evolution of this uh, thought process. It's a single center retrospective study. They uh, had 36 patients with asymptomatic scoliosis and they had myelomeningocele lipomas uh, or uh, thickened phylum uh, terminales. Uh, 21 patients underwent a two-stage procedure and 15 patients had a concomitant uh, untethering and spinal correction procedure, and they had an average five-year follow-up. In both groups, there was no evidence of any new neurological or shunt-related complications. And it, it's pretty obvious uh, in, in, uh, you know, on face value that in the two-stage patients, obviously, they'd have a longer cumulative operative time. Uh, longer cumulative lengths of stays. There was also more blood loss, higher incidence of wound infections, and a higher incidence of dural tears in the two-stage procedures. So this is the beginning of the evolution to, to do these procedures in one sitting as opposed to two sitting. Uh, in 2010, this paper was um, uh, published from a very good group at Triners Hospital in Philadelphia. It was a single center retrospective study 17 asymptomatic, consecutive asymptomatic patients with myelomeningocele. They, none, uh, no patient had untethering for at least a year prior to surgery. They had, each patient had at least two year follow-up. And each one of these patients underwent a single stage posterior spinal deformity correction with an average correction of 57%. And these are very good surgeons. Uh, Dr. Samdani is a neurosurgeon fully trained in, in uh, pediatric um, orthopedic surgery as well. And in their hands, they had no new neurological or shunt-related complications. And you can see on the uh, table on the bottom right, 
the amount of correction that they got. So this was again, a really good forward step and good evidence saying that in patients with myelomeningocele, you can uh, do uh, uh, deformity correction without uh, prophylactic untethering. So the next paper to look at uh, is a paper by uh, Hannah Goldstein. And you, as you look at it, I'm actually a co-author and Dr. Anderson is the senior author on this paper. So it's gonna be hard to debate against this one. So it, this was a multi-center interdisciplinary retrospective cohort study. Had, we took 208 patients less than 21 years of age. All of them had asymptomatic myelomeningocele and they all underwent some form of spinal deformity surgery. The group, uh, the patients were divided into three groups. And the first group was they had concomitant untethering. The second group had prior untethering within three months of their uh, deformity correction. And then the last group went no prophylactic untethering. The primary outcomes were motor sensory changes in 90 days. Secondary outcomes include surgical side infections, unplanned return to the operating rooms or uproars, uh, the mean overall length of stay and any complications. So this is the data, it's a little bit of a couple of busy tables, but I'll, I'll, I'll point your attention to the important findings here. So first off, uh, in patients with concomitant or prophylactic untetherings, uh, the higher rate of blood loss compared to those who had no uh, prophylactic untethering, that, that uh, uh, is, is fairly obvious. However, it was, it was clear that patients with concomitant prophylactic untethering or prophylactic untethering had a, a significantly higher rate of surgical site infections and uh, return to the OR and longer lengths of stay. And so you could say it clearly that the morbidity associated the, with the procedure was, was very high uh, in, in, this, in this multidisciplinary group. And I'll also turn your attention to the fact that uh, uh, about, so 41% of the patients underwent a growth-friendly construct and 13% of the patients underwent a spinal shortening procedure or three column osteotomy as part of their uh, uh, treatment. So I just want to uh, uh, bring that to your attention uh, as part of the uh, uh, discussion here in a second. So as far as follow-up, no patient in any of the three groups had worsened motor or sensory function uh, 90 days post-operatively. Uh, and patients with prophylactic untethering were most more, more likely to experience a surgical site infection, a return to the operating room, and a blood transfusion. So clearly, the risks of prophylactic untethering outweigh the benefits of those procedures. The only downside to this procedure is that I pointed out before, about 54% of the patients underwent uh, either a spinal shortening procedure, a three-column osteotomy, or some sort of growth-friendly procedure where they would have small sequential changes in their, uh, in their, in their spine uh, uh, deformity and length, which really doesn't reflect the typical spine lengthening one stage deformity correction procedures that we associate with this type of condition. So the conclusion from this study, very big conclusion is that most of not all asymptomatic myelomeningocele patients do not need prophylactic untethering prior to deformity correction. So recently, 2019, this was a paper published in uh, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine from an a, a, a orthopedic group uh, from Nanjing in China. And uh, I'm going to go over this in a little bit of, of detail because this is an important study. And, uh, it, it's, and this is the one that a lot of people refer to when they talk about this, uh, this uh, topic. So it was a uh, retrospective case control study. They had 57 patients in the CS uh, plus IA group, which means congenital scoliosis plus um, intraspinal anomalies. Congenital scoliosis, they defined as uh, failures of segmentation or formation or both. So patients with hemivertebrae, clopophile, and things like that. Intraspinal anomalies were defined as uh, split cord malformations type one or two, syringal myelia or tethered cord. And I put tethered cord in quotes. So we're gonna talk about that in a second. Patient ages were from 10 to 20 years. Um, and all patients underwent a one stage posterior correction. Uh, uh, there were no three column osteotomies performed uh, between 
The two groups, there were no differences in age, sex, spinal curve pattern, the main cob angle or flexibility of the curb. There's also no difference in the amount of curve correction, implant complications or neurological complications. In the entire cohort, there were only three intraoperative neural monitoring alerts. There were two in the uh, uh, group with interspinal anomalies and one without. And there was only one patient with any neurological um, uh, uh, deficit had transient uh, lower limb weakness in the uh, group without interspinal anomalies. So what did so here's a here's a table that I want to uh, show that the breakout of the types of coexisting interspinal pathologies in the interspinal anomalies group. So they had a fair number of patients with split cord malformations. You can see uh, uh, 23 patients with just uh, split cord malformations alone, 14 with tethered cord alone. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Excuse me. Um, and they had combination um, uh, of, of the two uh, 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 pathologies plus syringomyelia as well. Uh, here's a here's a uh, just a, a representative uh, uh, a figure from the paper showing the type two split cord malformation with the bony septum in the middle and how they would go ahead and uh, correct these procedures without. Uh, 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 correction of the interspinal anomaly. So there are pros and cons of this study. The pros of this study is that it's extremely promising and it implies that many interspinal uh, or many spinal and tethering procedures may be overused prior to spinal deformity correction. And it strongly suggests uh, that both split cord malformations type one and two do not need prophylactic untethering before spine deformity correction. However, there are some drawbacks to this study, and that is the fact that they defined tethered cord as the presence of a fatty phylum or a thickened phylum or both. And I think us as neurosurgeons, pediatric neurosurgeons who see these things all the time, this is highly controversial and it's very debatable and it's quite possible that patients with thickened phylum or fatty phylum is just a variation of normal and an asymptomatic patient with these radiographic findings isn't real, aren't really tethered at all. So they're misusing the term and it's not really um, accurate. And, the, and, and again, syringomyelia is not really a tethering lesion. And it's unclear to me why it was uh, um, in, included in the uh, tethering group. So these are fine points of the study, but it's, it, it still makes a very strong case for uh, not untethering uh, uh, these, uh, a, a large number of these patients beforehand. So I put this little table together to kind of help myself get my, my head around this topic. And I want to share it with you. Um, and at the top, so we're looking at scoliosis in an asymptomatic patient. Along the top, we're going to look at the type of intradural pathology, split cord malformation, phylar abnormalities, myelomeningocele, meaning that the placode is stuck, or whether there's an intraspinal lipoma. On the y-axis, you have the type of scoliosis, AIS, congenital, early onset, and neuromuscular. So if you look at AIS, uh, adiopath, uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, it's very rare to have any type of intradural uh, or interdural interspinal pathology. So we can, we can skip that group in that regard. However, for congenital scoliosis, clipophiles, hemivertebrates, it's not that uncommon. And the, uh, the Chinese paper, Zhao's paper really strongly suggests that with patients with split cord malformation and phylar abnormalities, it's safe to go ahead and uh, uh, correct these patients without um, uh, untethering them. The patient population that's in yellow, I put here because it's in question marks, is, uh, is are, are lipomas. And the only paper of all of them that address this uh, group is the uh, paper by Maida in 2011, and they only had and they only had four patients with lipomas in their group. So in my mind, uh, that's a that's a yellow light rather than a green light, and you're going to take that on a case by case basis. Children with early onset scoliosis typically it's more of a thoracic insufficiency syndrome, and they undergo growth friendly procedures. You don't see a lot of them with split cord malformations, but you might want to take some caution. But you chances are this is probably yellow going on a green light here. Clearly with the phylar abnormality, you're okay to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and clear them for, the, for their growth-friendly procedures and final lengthening. Uh, 
Again, the lipomas are a little bit more difficult to uh, make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. For neuromuscular patients, which are very, very difficult sometimes, split cord malformations, there's just no data on the subject, so that's why they gave this a yellow light. But again, with filar abnormalities, definitely a green light supported by the medical evidence. And then with myelomeningocele and where the, where the placode is stuck, uh, in asymptomatic patients, definitely a green light with two studies, the Goldstein study and the Samdani study, showing that you can go ahead and safely do those. Again, yellow light on the patients with lipomas. So multiple questions remain, and, and may, maybe some of you, some of this is alphabet soup with the uh, spine uh, growth-friendly procedures and what those mean so that the, the, the vector or the vertically expandable prosthetic titanium rib uh, I have always uh, 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 told the orthopedic surgeons it's safe to go ahead in uh, and putting these patients in and, and doing their uh, lengthening procedures uh, despite any type of radiographic tethering. For the magic rods, which means uh, magnetic expandable um, uh, correction procedures on, shown on the right-hand side, definitely it's the same sort of concept, slow gradual progression for, for thoracic insufficiency. The, the tethering procedures, I don't know a lot about. I, I don't think there's a, a contraindication to go ahead to do those in the face of uh, a, a, a radiographic tethering lesion. And then obviously for patients with, uh, that are, might undergo spinal column shortening procedures, VCRs, three column osteotomies, or spinal columns uh, uh, shortening for tethered cord syndrome, which is coming out more and more over time, definitely green light for both of those. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that the vast majority of asymptomatic patients with scoliosis and intradural pathology may undergo spinal deformity correction without uh, prophylactic untethering. The only possible exceptions would be patients with spinal lipomas who undergo a large one-stage posterior corrective procedure. And that's basically just because of lack of data and that's something that we should be exploring. So, uh, I'm sorry, Rich, the medical evidence just clearly doesn't support you. You're gonna have a hard time uh, uh, supporting this topic. So, uh, so many of us uh, would like to look at this uh, more carefully. So the ideal study to look at this would include uh, preoperative variables, the type of scoliosis, the type of intradural pathology, obviously the neurological status and curve flexibility. You'd look at outcome measures such as monitoring events, amount of curve correction, neurological outcomes, complications, need for further procedures. And then I think it really needs to be done in a registry type format. It needs to be multidisciplinary with orthopedic surgeons involved, multi-center, prospective, definitely protocolized so everybody's on the same page. And you could argue that in a randomized, uh, that there's enough clinical equipoise here potentially that a randomized study uh, could be justified. So getting back to our case, uh, here's our kid again, and uh, with his fatty phylum, low-lying conus and progressive scoliosis, we uh, went ahead and uh, gave him the green light to go ahead and have his uh, deformity correction. He went intraoperative, I'm sorry, preoperative urodynamics, which was normal. Uh, we didn't untether his cord. He had a L3 hemivertebrae resection and a short segment fusion, and he did really well after surgery. Here's another patient I saw a couple of weeks ago that's really complex and she's got this big sweeping, big sweeping thoracolumbar curve. And you can see that on the uh, coronal MRIs. This is actually a sagittal MRI. She's got this height, she's extremely hyperlordotic in the lumbar area and you can see the spinal cord coming down in the lipoma stuck to here on the sagittal plane and on the axial you can see uh, the lipoma here as well. So uh, what to do with this uh, child? She's pretty high functioning. Um, uh, she's asymptomatic from her tethering at this point. But she's, got, she's got an over 100 degree curve and she's gonna need to be corrected at some point. We may put her in halo gravity traction for a while and just fuse her uh, with, with what we get. And uh, I'm, I'm probably not gonna jump in and untether this patient beforehand. So uh, for those of you who don't go into the orthopedic spine room, I, want, I took a little quick video the other day and I wanted to share it with you and I want to show you what, what really goes on uh, uh, there uh, while uh, surgery is happening. So I want to, hopefully this audio will happen. 
Best quote of all time, I must be six inches taller. Anyway, so thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to Dr. Anderson's remarks. Thank you very much, Doc, for a really, really informative and um, uh, very interestingly put uh, argument. Uh, uh, without making any comments, I think it is fair to be completely unbiased and uh, go on to the speaker on the other side, Richard Anderson. Richard, all yours to share your opinion against what Doug has said so far. Okay, thank you. Time to teach the teacher. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sandeep. It's, it's a real honor to be, uh, to participate in this class of the Titan seminar and uh, I do appreciate the invitation and, um, Doug's made some, you know, very solid arguments here and uh, very uh, um, going to be difficult to, to take down these arguments, but we're going to give it our best shot here. Uh, so I'm going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes uh, with you guys trying to uh, change the tide of opinion uh, and argue that in children with scoliosis, asymptomatic tethering um, deformity surgery should not be done without untethering first. So there are three primary arguments uh, that detethering needs to be done before any kind of deformity correction surgery. The first and probably the most important is that detethering can delay or prevent scoliosis progression and the need for deformity surgery uh, in, in many cases. The second argument is that deformity surgery, if you do it without detethering, then it's more complicated and more risk for, for different reasons. The third reason is that detethering after deformity surgery is also more complicated with more risk. So let's go through these in, in more detail. Let's focus first on the, the, the first comment, which is detethering can delay or prevent scoliosis progression. So here's a six-year-old girl who presented with scoliosis that you can see here. She's got a left thoracic curve. She had no symptoms, she had no skin lesions, she was neurologically intact. But as part of, at least in, in my practice and many others, any, and it's kind of standard of care, and any patient who presents with scoliosis at a young age is gonna get an MRI. And the MRI shows a tethered spinal cord that you can see here with a lipoma. So she underwent um, detethering for that lipoma or section of the lipoma and detethering. And here's her scoliosis, her spine x-ray about a year later. So you can see a clear improvement in the scoliosis uh, after the detethering uh, procedure. So the question is, what type of evidence is there that there's a relationship between the two? So McClellan was, was one of the first people to publish in 1990 a relationship between the progression of scoliosis and detethering. His study focused primarily on myelomeningocele patients uh, and what his conclusions and that group's conclusions were was that by performing a detethering operation, you can slow the progression of scoliosis and in some cases prevent the need for scoliosis correction surgery. These findings were then echoed by several other studies which you can list here over the next several years. So probably the, one of the most recent best studies to look at this was the group out of Hopkins, Matt McGirt's study. And the reason for that is it had about 30 patients and it looked at a, a kind of a broad variety of tethering as opposed to just myelomeningocele patients. And what you can see here is that 
even at, at eight years out from a detethering procedure, only about 50% of the patients did their scoliosis progress. An even smaller number had to go on to actually require uh, fusion surgery. And if you look at risk factors for this, it turns out that if at the time of detethering, patients had a Cobb angle of less than 40 degrees, they had a six times less a reduced instance of need of, of progressing in the scoliosis. And if they were more spinally mature, if they had a risk of three, four, or five, they had three and a half times less likelihood of scoliosis progression. So in this study, there's a higher risk of curve progression after a telespinal cord release if they have a bigger curve or bigger Cobb angle, if they had a younger age, if they were skeletally immature, if they had a thoracic level myomagnocele, or they had a, a greater degree of vertebral body rotation at the apex. But at the end of the day, all these studies, what they all point to is that if you perform detethering for primary detethers before scoliosis surgery, it can delay the need and sometimes prevent the need for scoliosis for, for, uh, surgery. And this is a really important point because most pediatric neurosurgeons don't take care of patients with early onset scoliosis. And the majority of these tethers present in young children. And if they're picked up by school for scoliosis as the primary symptom, like this patient I just showed you, then taking care of early onset scoliosis and managing these patients is, can be very, very difficult. You're talking about patients that require you know, multiple um, bracing for years upon years, maybe need serial casting. And if you do pull the trigger and have to take them to the operating room to place some type of growth-friendly construct, the chances for complication, the overall complication rates for those patients is much, much higher than just patients who are undergoing definitive, scoli uh, definitive fusion surgery. So if there's any possible way you can delay the need for this, even if you can't prevent it, that is really clinically meaningful. And these studies suggest that even in patients that needed scoliosis surgery in the end, it delayed progression by anywhere from uh, two to three years. So as Doug mentioned at the end of his talk, though, this has prompted um, us to recently launch an international multi-center study looking at this through the Pediatric Spine Foundation, which is a, a multidisciplinary international group studying patients with early onset scoliosis, has almost 6,000 patients in the database. Uh, and we're starting to look through these patients to develop a, a cohort study um, comparing groups of patients that with early onset scoliosis that had tethering lesions, underwent detethering, and then followed their scoliosis versus patients who didn't have a tethering lesion and just had scoliosis progression, because that type of comparative study has never been looked at before. So let's look at the second point. The second main reason that tethering, detethering needs to be done is that deformity surgery without detethering is more complicated and has more risk. So here's a two-year-old girl with tetrasomy 18 and progressive scoliosis. She was initially braced, but then she moved out of state and was lost to follow-up, came back three years later when she was about five years of age, and the scoliosis had progressed to 92 degrees. So she was taken to the operating room and a vector was placed. During that procedure, or at the beginning, during positioning, we put her in traction and we had loss of potentials. Traction was removed and the potentials returned. So we figured, well, maybe, maybe I did the tractor, maybe it was a, uh, a technical issue. So we tried it again. We put her back in traction, lost the potentials again, took her out of traction and the potentials came back. So then we re-reviewed her MRI and upon closer inspection, it showed that the, the, the bottom of the conus was kind of at the top of the L3 body. So it was a mildly low-lying conus, had some trace fat. So we suspected a tethered spinal cord. We went out, talked to the family, and they agreed. We came back in. We did a small operation. We cut the phylum, closed it up, and then we placed the child back in traction, did a correction from 90 degrees to about 45 or 50 degrees, without any change of potentials. So the only thing different that happened in this case between losing potentials twice in traction and then being able to proceed with traction and a deformity correction surgery, which lengthens the spine, is we cut that file. So 
the use of neuromonitoring is routine in spinal deformity surgery to protect against neurological injury. And depending on the type of scoliosis surgery that you're undergoing, the rate of changes of neuromonitoring is anywhere from 2% in an idiopathic adolescent scoliosis to greater than 50% if you're doing a vertebral column resection or, or another higher level complex surgery. And the bottom line is that if you lose potentials during a scoliosis correction surgery, it makes for a very bad day. And if that happens and you have not detethered them first, there is no way to know whether the reason you're losing your potentials is because you're changing the shape of the spine in some way that the spinal cord doesn't like, or it's because they've, they haven't been detethered. And if you detethered them, you would have been able to proceed like that last case. And if you lose potentials, there's a, you've got a higher risk of aborting the case. You may have to, if the potentials don't come back, you may be aborting the case and going home and coming back another day. And even if you do continue, it's much more likely you're gonna have less correction because you're not gonna feel comfortable doing a maximum correction. Deformity surgery changes the shape and the position of the spinal cord. The forces are rapid and forceful. You've got scoliosis that has progressed over years, slowly, slowly changing the shape of the spinal cord. And then within minutes, literally minutes, you are straightening the spine. We know that there's a highest risk of neurological injury in cases of kyphosis or congenital malformations, or if they have a pre-existing neurological condition. And the, the, there, you know, the, Doug mentioned cases and there have been other reports about, well, in cases where you're doing spinal column shortening, well, then you can safely proceed without detethering. But the vast majority of spinal deformity surgery out there does not shorten the spinal column. It lengthens the spinal column. On average, children with scoliosis are one and a half to two inches taller after you repair the, you do their scoliosis correction. Every time you drop in that con, that rod, that first rod on the concave side to correct the deformity, and you look at your osteotomies. Once you rotate that rod and turn it from scoliosis to kyphosis, you see the gaps of those osteotomies open up. You're lengthening the spinal column in the vast majority of cases. But even if you look at cases where you are doing three column osteotomies, where you do shorten the spinal column, these are the cases where you've got the highest rate of intraoperative neuromodulating changes, up to 50%. There will be manipulation and traction on the cord if you're doing a BCR. And these are the patients that have the highest rate of postoperative neurological injury and complications. And you just cannot know whether it's because you've changed the shape of the spine or because they haven't been detethered. This is a study by Z and Al in 2014, looking at about 70 patients that underwent three column osteotomies. And the, there was an 18 fold increased risk for postoperative neurological problem if there was an associated you know, uh, intraspinal anomaly like a tethered spinal cord. The only thing that was more risk is if the patient already had, had a neurological uh, deficit beforehand. So let's move on to the last comment, which is detethering after deformity surgery is more complicated and with more risk. So this is an 11-year-old patient, international patient presented with severe spinal deformity. MRI shows a split cord malformation. So the question is, are you going to do a, a vertebral column? This is a case that would need a vertebral column resection. So should you detether before or should you not detether? Well, Doug presents some arguments that maybe you don't have to, and there's some validity to that. But deformity surgery most commonly involves posterior instrumentation and fusion. And let's say you go ahead and do that surgery. And then down the road, at some point later, the child presents developed symptoms of tethering, neurological problems, neurological problems. Then you've burned your bridges. You've got to go back in there. You've got to drill through a fusion mass and a bunch of scar tissue. You potentially could have to remove some rods. Most of the time you don't need to, but you might have to. And probably the most significant thing is if you get an infection or SSI from a CSF leak or something like that, and then you have to remove the spinal hardware, you're talking about months on end of, of complications and antibiotic treatment. And you have no doubt made this operation significantly more complicated. And this issue of if you do spinal, if you do deformity surgery without untethering, what are the chances that patients down the road can develop symptoms and signs of tethered spinal cord? No one has ever looked at that. There's no study looking at that whatsoever. So to conclude, the primary reasons 
that detethering should be done before deformity correction surgery is that detethering can delay or prevent scoliosis progression and the need for deformity surgery. And that's pretty clear. If you do deformity surgery without detethering, if you have a loss or a change in your signals intraoperatively, which will happen, if you do enough scoliosis surgery, that will happen. And it happens not infrequently, depending on the type of scoliosis surgery you're doing, then it becomes more complicated because you, there's no way to know how to interpret those changes. And it's much more likely you're not gonna be able to achieve the goals of the surgery that you set out to do. And then if you don't detether and you do deformity surgery and children then later develop symptoms and signs of tethered cord syndrome and you have to go do detethering, you've created, you've burned your bridges and you've made a much more complicated situation. So you've now heard from two titans. You've heard two opinions. But this debate that we're talking about today has been raging on for decades. And so much so that back in the 80s, Hollywood got a hold of this. And they made a film about this. And my old partner, Neil Feldstein, he was able to capture some uh, the culmination of this film that I'm going to show you in a minute here, because there may be some people out there, and Doug has tried to present the argument that there's clinical equipoise on this. But what I would argue to you, and what has been demonstrated in film and this debate over decades, is that in the end, there can be only one. In the end, there can be only one. So th thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. That was an amazing piece of, um, of argument. I think really historically, uh, both of you would probably agree that the reason why we have this problem is because traditionally, Pediatric neurosurgeons went and detethered the small children and then handed them over to their orthopedics colleagues who did deformity, unlike the two of you. This is the practice in major parts of the world. Perhaps it doesn't apply to me as well, but in, in majority parts of this planet, the pediatric neurosurgeons are just happy with the untethering and are extremely happy to hand over to orthopedic colleagues who don't know very much about untethering but are very happy to do the fix, fixing of the spine. And I think really this is what has caused all the problems as far as which is good and which is bad. And with spine surgeons now becoming very prominent for good or bad reasons all over this planet, now they often feel, why do we need pediatric neurosurgeons in the first place when we can just fix the deformity? And that's what started probably an argument in the orthopedic literature as to why at all do we need to do anything about the, uh, the, uh, the tethered element uh, if we can get away with fixing without having these dreadful pediatric neurosurgeons around in the first place? But what strikes me, and I'm going to ask both of you this question, is suppose you have a child who is asymptomatic with a split cord malformation in the first place, a demonstrated type 1 split cord malformation, asymptomatic, but a, a good split cord malformation, would you offer this asymptomatic child untethering in the first place? Um, I, I think that um, my previous practice was to definitely offer that patient untethering, uh, especially you could also particularly make the argument if the, if the bony septum is against the crotch of the in, in the corner where the spinal cord splits and as part of the deformity correction, you think there's gonna be traction on the cord. Um, and uh, I, I think that the medical literature from what I've seen really strongly suggests that you can do it safely without it. And it, it depends if the, if the bony septum and certainly if the patient had neurological changes, you definitely untether beforehand. But I think an asymptomatic patient, I would give the green light to go ahead and, and untether without I mean, so do the correction without untethering. I'm interested Richard, what Rich has to say. Richard, do you agree with that? 
I don't think so. <laughs> so in in and it's it's. Do you it's, not agree with anything that you said? <laughs> so in my mind, and you know, it the real crux of the issue is between primary tethering and secondary radiographic tethering. Okay, what prompted that study that that Doug described about the myeloma ingus seal is that we all know that after a primary detethering procedure all the patients are radiographically gonna appear tethered. And what, what didn't make sense to me is you've got a patient who was detethered you know, at birth or at a young age, and then later they develop scoliosis, and now they're 12, 13, 14, and they need deformity correction surgery, and their MRI looks radiographically tethered, but they have no symptoms, and they don't have tethered cord syndrome, it just makes no sense to me that those patients have to go back and get prophylactic detethering. And that's what that myeloma ingocele study was about. And a lot of the studies are about yeah, in no, terms of- Forget scoliosis. I'm just saying if you have a child who's simply got a type one split quad malformation, oh. who's asymptomatic, would you untether that child? Yeah, uh, yes, I would. I guess the question I would come back to you, Sadeep, is how many times have you seen a patient present with a split cord malformation who has not developed scoliosis? Uh, I think a fair number of times we have children that have split cord without scoliosis. Everybody doesn't get it. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the it's reason why I ask this question is if you have an asymptomatic split cord malformation, most of us would say go and untether. It's pretty safe to do it with intraoperative neuromonitoring then once they develop scoliosis and have a split cord malformation, why do we then say don't correct the split cord malformation, just fix the scoliosis? You know, you, you know what I'm yeah. trying to say? Yeah, so absolutely. If, if we are prophylactically untethering a split cord malformation without scoliosis, what's the argument of not prophylactically untethering a split cord malformation with scoliosis and saying that, We'll, we'll just fix the spine and not do anything to the split cord. Would that make sense? This is what I was going to ask Doug. Um, I, I'll just give an anecdotal uh, 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 case where I was involved with a con concomitant split cord malformation, bony septum, spinal cord deformity correction case. We, I did the split cord and we watched where the bony septum was and then we watched the deformity correction and there just wasn't that much motion, very little motion, maybe a millimeter or two of the, where the bony septum was in relationship to the spinal cord. This was mid thoracic. So you wouldn't expect a lot of motion there, but it was in the middle of the deformity. And what struck me was just how little motion there was that could have caused spinal cord compression or, or neuromonitoring changes. So that's just one case but it, it did, uh, for my opinion, I wish we had more evidence of that because it's just, we just, we just don't know in a lot of circumstances. Yeah, Which would... brings us really to the point, is there any uh, radiological MRI parameter or any sort of intraoperative neuromonitoring parameter that can be used for, as a predictive tool to decide whether if you correct, you could run into trouble with the tethering uh, component? Have we had anything at all on that front? Not in terms of tethering. I, I'm not aware of anything in terms of tethering. Clearly, in terms of the type of spinal deformity with the deformity angular ratio, which Lanky has, has published, you know, the sharper the turn, the sharper the kyphosis uh, or scoliosis, you know, over a shorter number of segments, then during correction, there's the highest risk for, um, um, you know, for some type of neurological injury. But I have not heard of any, any type of classification system. I'm not aware of anything in terms of predictors regarding. The presence of tethering or not, but you know, overall, just to you know, kind of uh, piggyback on what Doug said, you know, it, it in in my opinion, the risk of doing a primary detethering operation for a type one split cord from malformation is probably less than the risk of even getting neuromonitoring changes during deformity correction during a split cord malformation surgery. And, and again, it, I do think it burns your bridges going back later if they subclinically develop symptoms. So I would definitely do a primary detether on that patient. But if you do a primary detether when they're three years old and then their scoliosis is when they're 10 and they need deformity surgery, if they're asymptomatic from the detethering, I would not go back a second time and detether because they've already been detethered. 
Yeah, on the other hand, it, patients like your last case that you showed, it doesn't make sense to do a fixation without uh, addressing the split cord malformation because you're there, you're operating in the same anatomical site and it really doesn't make sense to say you'll come back again to that place should that patient become symptomatic. I think you, I think everybody would agree with that. And I and, mean, and irrespective of which side of the fence you're on, if you're operating in that place, you may as well get that uh, spur removed and the cord detethered because you're operating in, in exactly the same place. Uh, Doug, do you have any opinion about yourself? Uh, I mean, I, I'm not talking about literature, but something that you've thought about over the years that you've been doing this sort of surgery. Is there any, anything, any parameters that you think might be predictive to predict which are the patients that will require preoperative tethering? Some MRI features, you know, there was this business of doing prone MRIs on children to see how much the cord moved forward and that sort of thing. Do you think any of that really would help decide which ones should be untethered primarily? Yeah, maybe my approach has been unscientific in some degrees, but I do ask the orthopedic guys, how big of a untethering procedure are you going to do? Are you going to go for it and try to get the patient near straight? They're going to go from 60 degrees to 10 degrees. How much lengthening are you going to do? Uh, our, our place does a lot of growth friendly procedures, a lot of vectors and magic rods. So, and I don't even hear from them and they just go ahead and do those things. The smaller corrections are no, no problem. Uh, but they come to me when they're when they're thinking about the final correction, and uh, and you know it's totally unscientific. But I say if you're going to do a big correction, and it looks like they got a at risk, they have a tight cord. It looks like it's cord. We always get an MRI. It looks like it's tight and tethered. If there's any evidence of any symptoms, I will do a prophylactic untethering. The other thing we do, the other consideration is our cordectomies you know, that we've all done for gibbous deformities. And we just, we just cut right across the cord at the bottom of the fecal sac, tie it off, and it makes their procedure very easy. Uh, and so that's, that's a whole nother subject, but, um, but that's, that, that's my approach. It's not very scientific, but it's worked over the years. Which in fact brings us to a question that Mark Proctor has. And Mark says, do you ever factor in whether the spine will be shortened or lengthened? by the orthopedic surgeon. For example, the hemivertebral resection often leaves the spine at the same length or a bit shorter. So do you, do you, do you ever factor in whether the spine would be shortened or lengthened in your decision as to whether you will detether first or at the same time as you're doing the correction or not? So is spinal shortening or lengthening a factor? Could it be? I mean, if you look at it logically, it would seem that that would be an important issue. If you're going to lengthen the spine, then you probably cause a tethered component to uh, pull a little more. So do you think that matters? That's the question that Mark has. Yes, I think it's a great point. And I, I think it does matter. Um, I just haven't taken the complete leap of faith to, to not prophylactically detether. And what I mean by that is that I think there is substantially less risk um, doing deformity surgery without untethering if you are shortening the spinal column. And I think there's a lot of, you know, Doug mentioned this at the end of his talk, there's a lot of emerging, or there's some emerging literature for patients who have had, you know, multiple, you know, reoperative complex lipomas um, and uh, where their outcomes are getting worse and worse at very high risk um, to third, fourth time reoperation uh, and doing a spinal column shortening operation instead. Um, and the, you know, the preliminary data on that are, are pretty good. So I do think there's much less risk with the spinal column shortening operation moving forward without detethering. But if I had a kid with, you know, uh, a hemivertebrae who's three years old, um, you know, or picked up earlier, I'm going to detether that kid because I want to do everything possible to delay uh, possible progression of that scoliosis. Because if I could do a hemivertebrae resection, if it continues to progress and I can do a hemivert resection when the kid's five years of age instead of three years of age, you know, when you've got bigger screws and less likely for hardware failure, uh, that's what I want to do. Doug, your input on that? No, I don't have anything else to add as well. You know, just interestingly enough, I was uh, moderating a session of um, off split cord malformation and scoliosis in a spine meeting in, in India just last week. 
And uh, there were a number of pediatric neurosurgeons who were on the panel and when uh, they said they would do a two-stage procedure, first detether and then do a fixation, I asked them what's the duration between the two procedures and amazingly most of them said four to six weeks, which doesn't really make sense because if you're waiting, there is no point waiting six weeks because you're not going to have that uh, curve change in six weeks. So the, my question to Richard is, in fact, that if you're going to do a two-stage procedure, how long would you watch that curve to see whether that cob angle is getting better? And uh, when would you then decide that it's not getting better, I'm going to intervene? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. I think it really depends on the magnitude of the curve, Sandeep, because if you, know, if, if you got a, uh, if, for instance, the patient's presenting and they have a 60, 70. Yeah, 45 degree curve. And, oh. uh, and what do you do then? Oh, then I, I would detether and then I would, uh, I'm sorry, did you say five degree, 35 degree curve? 45. 45. Oh, yeah. you. Okay, 45, yeah. So yeah, 45 degree curve. Um, I would wait longer on that because again, you know, the data show that, you know, if you've got an idiopathic adolescent or, well, even though it's not exactly this situation, 45 degree curve, I would wait. I would wait and to make sure it definitively progresses because depending on their level of spinal maturity, they may be they may be okay living with a 45 degree curve asymptomatic for the rest of their life. Uh, if it's a 60 degree curve or 70 degree curve, I think it's a different story. And then in my opinion, it's just a matter of, you know, enough healing time to make sure you're not gonna have CSF leaks or other complications at the time of the deformity correction surgery. Uh Question, Doug, do you think meningomyelocils are different? So the open neural tube defects with scoliosis are different from, say, for example, the split cords or the lipomas that you talked about? Is there a difference between the meningomyelocils with scoliosis and the other tethering components with scoliosis? D difference in the tethering or the, or the, or the spinal deformity? A difference in the behavior when you correct the spinal deformity, whether they have a meningomyelocele versus the other tethering elements. Um, no, I, do, I don't think so. I mean, our, our guys are really careful. We, we haven't had uh, a lot of complications with the myelomeningocele kids and their corrections. I mean, we've lucked out, and, but a lot of those kids are managed with growth-friendly constructs for a long period of time. And then when they hit spinal maturity, the correction just is not as big the last time so they can go ahead and safely do it. So it's a hard question to answer because we just don't have a lot of experience with how, they, how the, how the, how the uh, different curves behave or how the tethering behaves because you know, we just haven't seen a lot of trouble with it. So that's why we're prone to not uh, do the upfront untetherings. That's another reason. <clears throat> Great. We're getting to an hour, so I'm gonna leave you with the final question for both of you. What about a child who has, who is mildly symptomatic, say with a foot weakness and has a split cord malformation and scoliosis? Would you would your attitude to this child be any different from your because you know there's I've just reviewed a paper from China with symptomatic tethered cord and scoliosis and they're still talking about doing the doing the um, scoliosis correction without doing anything to the tethered cord as saying that's a fixed neurological deficit. So I just wanted to get your opinion because we won't get to two experts like this um, on the panel very often. What if you have a, a you know, mildly symptomatic child with a foot weakness, a little sensory loss in the foot, who has got a scoliosis and split cord? Would your attitude be different in any way? So not asymptomatic. I mean, yeah, which is data shows you're a high risk of pre-existing deficit or a problem. I would, I would offer that patient untethering for sure. 100% agree. Great. So on that note, Agreement on both <laughs> sides seems a very good place to call it a day. We've reached one hour. So uh, thank you very much, Doug, and thank you, Richard, for uh, being with us today. And uh, it's been a great debate. And uh, all the best uh, for the festive season and wish you a happy new year. I think and now we have to say wish you a happier new year because the new year has to be happier for everybody than this year that's been. And it's not very difficult to hope that it will definitely be happier for everybody on this planet. So thank you once again. And it just remains for me to share with you, Linda, do we have a...
there seems to be a little bias towards Salt Lake City, and I apologize for that. But the next week's Clash of the Titans is episode 13. It's not next week, next month, next year, in fact. And because the 1st of January is the first Friday, we're going to have this on the 8th of January, Friday. The topic, ventricular size has no relation to the outcome of hydrocephalus treatment. We have Jay River Kembrin and Spiros from the United States and Greece, respectively and another gentleman from Salt Lake City who's going to moderate this debate. So thank you very much for being with us. Good evening, a very, very Merry Christmas and a very, very Happy New Year to wherever you are on this planet. See you and goodbye. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody.